okay i'm i'm going to be uh, mixing a few things here i'm going to be talking about what is it that is current evidence and current literature and then i'm also going to be talking a little bit about my own our own personal experience i i shouldn't be saying my because it's a team effort in in something like this we are all in a team and so i'd like to talk about our our uh, uh, you know experiences with covid so just look hospital uh, around the time just look hospital started admitting covid patients we were already seeing a little bit of covid and then it became a large number at some of the public hospitals kasturba hospital is a 550 bed uh, hospital which is uh, you know about a 90% occupancy and so we started with a few dozen patients and that went on to uh, to you know a few hundred patients so i think at last count we had probably done about 1500 patients so volumes wise we learned a, a great deal very quickly very quickly and uh, we learned a great things that were changing virtually okay so some of the things that we are going to be that i'm going to be talking about are are uh, what was therapy and i'll come to the, yeah so we we are you know when we say let's talk about all the evidence that are available at this time in terms of therapy if you look at the recovery trial which was three arms internationally one of the biggest trials on something like hydroxychloroquine that is very clear about the role of treatment the role of hydroxychloroquine in the treatment is virtually nil there was one of the hospitals in mumbai where a chest physician at uh, hinduja hospital was one of the arms of the trial we had to look at his numbers as well so recovery is clear about this part that there is no role for hydroxychloroquine in treatment there may be a role of hydroxychloroquine in prophylaxis but this is a trial that looks at about 24000 people so i doubt if that's going to be something that's going to be taken lightly i'm only making this point because there are so many treatments that you will hear about when we heard about the ivermectin part of treatment you know there were about 60 doctors from bangladesh a neighboring country who had no evidence it was only anecdotal it was their own anecdotal experience so with the with the covid state uh, government of maharashtra task force we spoke to them we spoke to about 52 53 of them to find out as to what their experience was and that the biggest amount of data is going to be coming out of sain hospital in mumbai and not not out of an american country where we will probably be looking at not probably i think the total number of patients is about 1500 patients whose data would be evaluated as to what was the right dose what was the right duration is it two doses or three doses of ivermectin how much doses of doxycycline how long and how at what duration did the viral stop shedding all right that's the other thing so i'll, I'll speak about that in just a minute's time as to which is the treatment that you should use there is some data about the use of a drug like colchicine there is some data about the use of of uh, something like uh, uh, lopinavir ritonavir which is a retroviral therapy all of these agents have got some mechanism that will actually inhibit the virus from replicating but whether that can be translated into covid-19 is the big issue as to whether you can translate data from another evidence and say that it works in covid is the big issue so a lot of the treatments and let me also share with you you know from the beginning of march to about uh, the end of june there have been about 33000 publications for covid and in the first week of july this was a disclosure right a little little early but i'll 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 talk about plasma because i'm i'm passionate about plasma we had uh, we were of the first people in the month of uh, in the month of uh, march and early april to start a dialogue with the then municipal commissioner of mumbai that to share with you that we have just just finished about two weeks ago our trial the icmr trial for the use of convalescent plasma in covid patients uh, kasturba hospital where i i i work uh, we were the second highest number of enrolled patients in convalescent plasma along with nair hospital and uh, the total number of patients that we gave plasma to and the people who actually recovered and had had survival benefit to plasma unfortunately right now i'm not in a position to share details with you but that details will be will be available in about i think a couple of weeks time when icmr releases the data out of 450 patients about 45 were were treated by us we were the second highest in india and that plasma to my mind is is very effective we are already looking at how to make that mainstream at uh, at just look hospital some part of the the ethics committee approval law has already okay so you know uh, i'm i'm going to also speak about 
you know, when I talk about public hospitals, I have to say that one of the things that ICMR shared with us was why the mortality rate in a place like Kasturba Hospital was one of the lowest in India. And so the point I'm making is one part of treatment. There are two things that we talk about in treatment. One part is the treatment of the viral infection itself and the cytokine storm that, that comes after that. The other part is the basics of ICU care. If you are able to handle both these things as well as you can, you should be able to have a very good you know, survival rate. And basics of ICU is, again, the core. It's not just the treatment. So two parts to the treatment. You know, One part is the viral shedding. There is very little evidence that viral shedding goes on for any more than 15 days. At the end of 15 days, it is less than 5%. Active viral shedding is less than 5%. The, the, the bulk of the viral shedding, up to 80%, stops by the end of the 7th to the 10th day. And so to continue with antivirals beyond that time, you would have to have a good reason. So that is left to the discretion of the clinician. The second part is the cytokine part, or what the agents that you're going to use in that time. So again, I would like to share here that both with favipiravir and remdesivir, there has been no evidence of survival advantage. There is no evidence of survival advantage. The only evidence is that you will shorten the duration of the acute illness. From a certain time, it will fall by about 30%, but there is no survival advantage to, to both these molecules. The role of something like tocilizumab is a monodirectional interleukin-6 inhibitor. So it inhibits only interleukin-6. The problem with tocilizumab is that it is... Interleukin-6 is not the only agent that will cause the cytokine storm in, in COVID. The cytokine storm functions at nine different levels. One of the agents that has got a lot more promise is something like etolizumab because it is like a monoclonal antibody that functions at not just interleukin-6, but also interleukin-1, interleukin-17, demonoprocess factor alpha, and maybe a couple of other ways that we don't as yet know. So there is, again, like I say, Tocilizumab and etolizumab both. All right, so a, a comprehensive kind of look at what are the things, like I was saying, that are going to be working or not going to be working, think are relevant, what we thought was relevant in the month of March, are probably, they have fallen by the wayside now in the month of July. A lot of the things that we think we know in July, if we reassess in October and November, we'll probably find that some of them have become redundant. So again, I say, please look at all therapies with an open mind. So then I'm, I'm, I'm now going to be coming to, to, uh, to one of the things that is in the pipeline, which is the, the, the vaccine part. Here, I'd like to share with you, I, I'm not sure uh, if you followed it, but there was a vaccine that was meant to be coming out uh, about a year ago, about, about two years ago, that got strongly rejected because of one fatal flaw. You see, this vaccine, uh, so one part of the vaccine is that when you are using a vector, which is meant to be the carrier in the vaccine, it is meant to have a very basic part of the genomic structure of the virus that cannot be altered. If it does that, it starts an immunological response. When this immunological response starts, there's, it's, like an, it's like an anaphylaxis. It's like a hypersensitivity response with a lot of fanfare. It got tested in a country like uh, Cambodia, also in Vietnam. And then it was started as a trial in India, and that it found no buyers in a place like this because it was starting this anaphylaxis kind of a reaction. The point I'm making here is, you know, vaccines will take between three and five years to be made. And when you try to compress the formation of the vaccine in nine months or 10 months or 12 months only because of a number of reasons, you should be careful that you do not miss those steps where the same value that you wanted to have. Please also uh, uh, bear in mind that uh, you know, from the beginning of the time that we know the, the novel COVID virus, there have been about 33 base mutations. They're, they're not point mutations, they are base pair mutations. And that a vaccine needs to be able to cover at least 50% of the strain. So there are 33 variations from the original vaccine from the time it has been discovered. And that when you say that, yes, I'm going to make this vaccine work for everybody, First thing is that, how long is the vaccine going to last? How long is the antibody that's going to last? The antibody at this time is meant to be lasting only for about three months' time. So are you then going to be offering four vaccines a year or five or six vaccines a year? And the second thing is, when you compress a three-year process into a nine-month process, are you actually overseeing or overlooking something that should have been taken into account? 
so first principles of medicine do no harm i i am personally of the of the opinion that the vaccine if it works is going to be a fantastic fantastic situation but i would like to approach it my personal opinion is i would like to approach it with a little bit of caution and trepidation we should see what are the results see again i'll tell you numbers wise the company that is manufacturing the vaccine in the trials with the oxford oxford arm of the trial says it will manufacture the vaccine for 1 billion vials will be available inside 6 months time from here that means it's going to be available by the time it's february march of next year a 1 billion yes that's going to look after 1/7th of the of the people who need the vaccine all over the world what also that means is that there are going to be those people the entire story of treatment is 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 based on two very basic principles one is to identify people as soon as you can two is to find out if they are going to be at risk there is a way to decide which are your patients who are going to be at risk there are blood tests that you can do but you should not rely only on blood tests there are those which are risk factors in your patients which will tell you that these are the people who are most likely to go into complications you should be able to decide your therapy from there there is a role of plasma i i am i will i will not be able to talk about that great deal here at this time vaccine i'd be a little bit careful uh, it's always a privilege to talk at just look founders day thank you kanta masand ma'am and mr haryan for this opportunity thank you dr sarosh katra and dr shrinivas desai and thank you aditya and the marketing team mr george alex and everybody who we are not seeing on the screens right now but who are responsible for having this event being as smooth as all is being thanks very much